So I'm hoping that I can give you every single thing that I've ever felt, everything I've ever done to maybe make a difference to you. And the way I want to start that is I want to tell you who Mike Holt is today and what he's accomplished. And, and, I, and I do this, it's, it's kind of funny. Um, when I was 61 years old, I, I qualified to ski at the World Championships in the professional class. In order to ski, in barefoot water skiing, I'm sorry. In order to ski at the World Championships as, as a professional, you have to have a qualifying score where you are the, the 20th best skier in the world of all men. And at the age of 61, I qualified and I was at the World Championships to ski in the professional class for the slalom event. Which, of course, nobody can believe that, including myself, because I didn't start barefooting until I was 32 years old. So now, my wife, I went to a banquet, and my wife got me a, a, little, a little polo shirt, and it said, um, pro class. And I got the pro class, and I felt a little uncomfortable wearing it to the banquet. So I called a friend of mine. His name is Heath Cooper. He's in Texas, and he's a barefooter. And I said, Heath, you know, my wife, this and that. And, and barefooting, I'm known as Holtzy. They don't call me Mike Holt, it's just Holtzy. And I got that from a world champion who I trained with, and he called me Holtzy. So that's how it started. He goes, Holtzy, in Texas, if you can do it, it ain't bragging. And I use that. So that, because sometimes even a successful person feels a little uncomfortable about the success, particularly saying it about the success. And so here I am, I'm only telling you, oh, what a wonderful thing I am. But I just want you to know, in Texas, it ain't bragging. Okay? All right. Let's talk about my life. Let's talk about where I'm at right now. I have a great relationship with God. I really feel God leads me. I'm sensitive to hearing him. And I, and as best I can, and I try to really consider what God wants for my life. So I'm at peace. I have a wonderful family. My daughter, Megan, is out there handling things. She'll be here shortly. My son, Michael, will be coming in here in a few minutes because he's going to be dropping off his daughter, so he's running a little late. I have seven kids. I have to show you a little email, and I haven't asked Megan this. I'm like, why did she send me this? This is something I got from my daughter, Megan. Of course, she doesn't know about it. She's not even in the room. And here's what she said. I just want you to know that I love you so much that I admire your presence, strength, and energy. You've had a, such an impact on my life and my personality that I sometimes laughed about how much I'm like you. At times, I exhaust myself because of the personality traits I got from you. But then I watch and I realize I'm leaves behind, and I'm then able to appreciate the bit I do. Might be a funny thing to say, but I feel normal when I'm around you, doing your thing. So thanks for that. I'm a better person because I love you. You know, that's kind of nice. And I got that August the 23rd. Totally random email, like, oops. <laughs> Why did you send me that email? Uh, I mean, it was just a random thing. Well, it might seem random to you, but it was when I came to your house after work, and I was exhausted. Hold on, we'll give you a microphone. Okay. Hello. <laughs> this is my daughter, Megan. Hi, Megan. Nice to meet you guys. Uh, it was when I came to your house after work, after a long day. I'm renovating my house, so I haven't had a home-cooked meal in a few weeks. And mom and dad were like, come over. We'll cook you a nice chicken and steak. So I went over there, and I'm drained. Ugh. And I see, out, I see all the way out the lake, my dad is working his butt off on the dock. And he's just working, working, working nonstop. Every time I see him, he's working. And that's really motivating for me, you know, because I imagine he had a long day as well. He worked earlier than I did, and he's still working you know, on his personal stuff to make his life better and have my kids enjoy time when they come over to Papa's house. And that's how I am sometimes at home. It's like I come home and I'm tired, but I still got to get this done. I still got to get this done. I still want to read. I still want to be a better person and work harder and be very successful. And other people find that um, personality trait of mine very exhausting 
and very pushy. Sometimes I seem like I'm aggressive and I can never relax. I can never enjoy the moment. Um, and when I saw my dad out there working, when every, everybody else is relaxing, I'm like, well, at least I'm normal. <laughs> <laughs> That's my girl. That's my favorite daughter, is Anna. <laughs> <laughs> so that's why that came out too. I sent you and I said, it's nice to see other people that work just as hard or even harder than me, you know. Well, you know, you bring out an important point, an interesting point. My very first world championships I ever qualified to ski in was in 2006. And I didn't never try to ski in a world championship. And I'm 55 years old at the time. And somebody called me, hey, congratulations, you qualified to ski the world championships. I'm like, what? So I, I got excited, I made arrangements, I traveled, and I went out to the World Champions, I skied there. And for the very first time in my life, when I was at the World Championship, I felt normal. Because everybody was eating better than me. They were training harder than me. They were more motivated than me. They were pushing each other. And anything I felt, and for a fact, I had to step up my game. So I qualified at the age of 55. And at the age of 61, because of the motivation, hanging out with those type of people, I only trained with world champion skiers. That, that's who I trained with after that. That's when I went into the pro class at the world championships and the national championships. So I felt normal. I, I've always felt alone. So what Megan is saying is when you're trying to improve yourself, you're going to be alone. And people are like, come on, can't you just relax? Let me tell you something. I have a great time working on the dock, killing myself. You know what I mean? I get in the house, I'm like exhausted. I mean, like that was a lot of fun. You know, so you got to be careful. And then my wife puts to sit at the beach, and I'm like, that's exhausting sitting at the beach watching you guys just sit there and like, we're supposed to do nothing. Can't you just sit down and relax? I'm like, no, I can't. All right, my family, my wife, I know she adores me. She just looks at me and she tells me, I'm so proud of you. My health, I'm in good shape. I take care of myself. Financial, yeah, I'm, I'm fine. I'm set. I don't have to work the business anymore. And my company, my employees know I'm not working in my company for, to make me any money. I'm working in my company right now to try to get Brian House trained to be able to have my skills and to get Megan set for the next generation. We have a business model for the next 30 years, and hopefully they will then figure out a business model that will continue the company. So I'm not working in my company to make money. I'm working in my company to be able to get the next level, get it ready to go. Work. I work hard. I work really hard. I still play. I still have my stuff. But let me just tell you some of the, my accomplishments. Barefoot water skiing. I started age 32. Age of 61, I skied in the pro class. I just, get, I just kept getting better and better and better. I think I have 18 or 19 gold medals. I think I have one bronze and one silver. I've won nine national barefoot water ski championships. I got out of barefooting two years ago because of an injury. And so because of the injury, I got into mountain biking. But before I got into mountain biking, I got into motocross. My boys were 17 years old and they wanted to get a motocross. I'm thinking, that sounds like a lot of fun. And there's no way I'm just gonna drive my kid to go to a track to ride dirt bike. So I'd never been on a dirt bike in my life and I was 48 years old. So I got on a dirt bike and it was the best time in my entire life for five years. Now, don't misunderstand me. I can't tell you how many concussions I've had. You can see my body, you see scars on the shoulder here, scars on the shoulder here. I broke scapulas, I mean, I broke collarbones. I've been knocked out, I collapsed my lung, I broke my scapula in the back there, I, my ankle one time, I took this huge triple, which I wasn't attempting to try, I just got the whole shot, and I was just so excited, I wasn't going to let go of this whole shot, and then, of course, I faced the, 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 the triple, instead of making it over the triple, because I never was going to make it my entire life, okay? And so, five years after doing that, I was in a hospital, and, and I had a wonderful time in the hospital. I mean, I had my cell phone with me. I had my laptop computer. People were giving me food. I mean, it was like nobody was bothering me. I got more, done, more work done in three days than I would have done any other way. I had so much fun. I was so bummed out I had to leave. It was great. <laughs> Seriously, it was great. I got a lot of work done. But surprisingly, I found out my dirt bike was stolen while I was in the hospital. And I never asked my wife, but that's the story I got. <laughs> so that's a true story. I don't know, but it was stolen. And I decided after so many times in the hospital, I had to quit one day. 
And I think at 53 or so was a good time to quit. So I got into auto racing, right? I mean, I'm in a, it's a wheel. I have a trailer. I take off for weekends. It's a boy kind of thing. So now I'm into racing cars. I did that for seven years, but it didn't work out that well because it's a setup. And, it's, you know, and my car was an exact replica of Jeff Gordon car. And the reason I picked that is because Jeff Gordon wanted to date my daughter when we met him in Atlantis in the Bahamas. And my daughter's like, no. He goes, well, you want my phone number? She goes, no. He goes, well, let me have your number. So he wanted to date her, and she just kind of blew him off. That was the day that they found out that his wife was getting a divorce, and it was in the newspapers in the Bahamas. And I said, well, you're a physical therapist, exercise physiology. Maybe you can get in the NASCAR and get these guys to become athletes. You don't have to date the guy. Anyways, I got pictures of Jeff Gordon. And my son, when we was taking pictures at the, at the club, Jeff Gordon turned around to me, and he goes, hey, you're not taking any pictures of me? And my son said, well, you're not family. And Jeff Gordon really appreciated us because he was just a guy. We didn't really care. So auto racing for seven years, kind of got out of that back in, uh, I think, uh, when I was uh, probably about 60. Now, I'm still barefoot water skiing, winning championships. Now I'm into mountain biking. And Brian House said one day, hey, you want to go mountain biking? I'm like, okay, whatever, you know. I go out there, and 30 minutes later, I'm like, I'm almost on the ground dead. I mean, I almost killed myself. I was exhausted, and I went immediately to a bike shop, and I spent $6,000. I got a bike, bought a bike, bought all the gear. I got the bike on a Wednesday, and then I raced my first race on a Sunday. And everybody, him and everybody else is like, who buys a bike who's never ridden a mountain bike ever? He gets it on a Wednesday and rides the race on a Sunday. And I didn't know you're not supposed to. I mean, I thought you, you, you race. I mean, you race... Barefooting, you, you race motorcycles, you race cars, you race bikes. And so I got a little aggressive in mountain biking. And so now my elbow is a problem. And I noticed this other elbow is a problem. So I want to back it down a little bit, barefoot a little bit more. We've got to work on the code changes. So that's my, my activity. I always had a distraction. Work. 41 years, been in business. Very profitable company. Had, had a record month sales. Last year was a record sales. Our products are continuously improving. I've taken probably 30,000 phone calls having to do with technical questions in my life. I've probably taught about physically 150,000 different individuals actually physically being in a class. My videos on YouTube have probably been seen over a million times. I've written or edited, revised probably 150 books. I've written over 250 magazine articles for ECNN magazine. I started with them in 1980. So I've been with the magazine for 36 years. The magazine has a subscription of 200,000 people a month. So I write for 200,000 people a month. And some of this stuff forces me to be a little bit different than maybe somebody else would be. When you write for 250,000 pe 200, people a month, you have to be careful. When you have 30,000 people calling you and asking you questions that are technical, life-saving kind of questions, I, I have to be right. You write books, and people are going to be using them in training programs. It has to be right. You create a video, and you expose yourself, and you put it on the Internet. It has to be right. And you'll see that because of my world and how I live, it, I think might have formed my brain and some of the wiring in my brain and some of the things that I've done. Travel. Megan's not here. Megan, we, you know, we, we're going to Italy, her and I, for about 10 days. Uh, her and I went to Germany. We went to, Am we went to Germany. We went to France and Paris and Belgium, Luxembourg, Amsterdam. I love Amsterdam. It was great. She so goes, Dad, that's because of all the pot that you were walking around in. And that's what made me like. I don't know. I didn't do pot, but I had a great time in Amsterdam just walking down the streets with, I guess, all the pot smoking around. I don't know. But it was great. We, we saw, it was just great. Uh, Michael and I, we're planning on probably next year, we're going to be taking, see, what I do is I take every one of my kids anywhere in the world for two weeks. Anywhere in the world for two weeks. So, because my family's important to me. So Michael next year will be doing a couple weeks. And then we got other ones. Um, my kids, totally committed to my kids. Always have been. I love I made sure my kids went to school. They all had the opportunity and pay for their college and finance them so they could go to college. I, uh, right now, pay for all my grandkids' private schools so they can not be in a public school. And I've already paid for all my kids' grandkids' college. I mentor. 
continuously, even if you don't want me to mentor you, I'm mentoring you. It doesn't really matter. You're in a gas station. You're right there. I'm talking to you. I mean, I'm, I'm on your case. You probably won't forget me, okay? And I spent time with you, Nick, on the phone. Brianna, Danita, I don't know if we spoke on the phone yet a little bit. So, I mean, I've, I'm committing a lot of my time to this. I have money in the bank. I have money in the checking account. I have money in the savings account. I have money in the retirement account. I have a business that's making money every single month. I'm healthy. I barefoot water ski right now still. I mountain bike. I, my health is perfect. I go to the doctors at least once a year. I see the dentist twice a year. I see a dermatologist once or twice a year. I make sure that I'm taking care of myself. <laughs> I'm not on any drugs. I don't have to have high blood pressure medicine. I don't have to have anything. So uh, by being drug free, I think you'll see as this program goes, maybe that's part of a success. I mentioned about my wife and my kids. And that's kind of like what I've done. I mean, I'm sure there's other things, but that's off the top of my head, some of the things that I've done in my lifetime. And that's where I'm at today. Now, let's talk about who's my cult, and I'll try not to cry. I didn't have a father. I, three, at three years old, he was in the Air Force, and he was gone. I didn't know anything about him. You know, so I'm, I'm just, my mom is single, and she married some guy, and she got married, I think, at the age of 13. She was from Columbia, so her mother was dead, so she just came with aunts and uncles, and so Washington, D.C., and so, you know, we're living in basements and aunt's houses and uncle's houses and moving around and doing whatever it has to do. And then she got married and, you know, the stepfather, you know, he didn't particularly like me or care about me. And you know, that's just the way it was, you know what I mean? And then at one point, uh, I think by the time I finally got to Miami, I had probably been in like, I don't know, 12 schools. See, when you're in a really very poor family and you're having to get kicked out of apartments or you're having to get tired of being in somebody else's house, then you have to go to different schools, right? Because you're moving over here, you go to school. Then you move over here, then you go to school. Then that didn't work out, and then guess what? Well, then you move out and you go back to where you were a year and a half ago, right? You go back to that house again, now you're in a school. And then, of course, you have a problem, then you leave, you know? And then, of course, you have a young mom, and, you know, and she's, what, 15 or 16 years old now with two kids. So by the time it was 10 years old, we came to Miami, and then she had a car accident, single mom. She had a car accident. Well, because she was in an accident, and at that time, she had broken, I guess it's called the femur up here, or the hummus, I'm not, humus, what is this? The femur. And so they had to put her in a body cast, and they had to put where they put like a pin here, and then they had the weights to trying to keep the legs straight. Whatever it was, it didn't work out. So she was in a hospital for 18 months, in bedridden, in a hospital. Well, they put us in foster care, because there was nobody that we could go to. Well, in the foster home, it only lasted three months before the foster home people had to move out of town. They closed the foster care place. Well, that being the case, they had to put kids somewhere in Florida. You can't just let them go nowhere. And so what they did was they put us in reform school. So we went into reform school rather than, you know, what else you got to do? You got to put a kid somewhere. So maybe people don't know about that. So I'm in reform school for about a year. Finally, I get out of reform school. I'm about 11 years old, actually getting ready to turn 12 years old. And... I had nothing. My mom had nothing. I mean, I remember we had no, no electricity. That's very common. We had gas, for whatever reason, we always had gas. No, I think we didn't have gas. I used to remember go out and buy a little grill and then buy charcoal, and then we would try to make some food or something like that. My mom was still bedridden, you know, because she's trying to get now to learn how to walk. And then I went, to, then I'm going to middle school, and I'm like, man, you know, and I had no clothes. I had clothes from the lady downstairs, husbands that my mom had stitched to make it smaller so I can fit. So I was going to go to middle school, and I got a job delivering newspapers. I found a guy, he was delivering newspapers, and he told me what you got to do. You got to drive over here, and you got to get over there, and you sit in the morning, and you see the guy, he's a manager. I'm 12 years old, I got there, and I waited for three hours. Nobody showed up. I was so disappointed. I saw the guy a week or two later. I said, what happened? He goes, no, not a left. You got to make a right. So that made a right, I sit there, Boom, the guy shows up. I said, listen, I want to deliver newspapers. It just so happened that he happened to have a route. I started delivering newspapers. And I delivered newspapers for five years. I would get up at 4 o'clock in the morning, 5 o'clock in the morning. I deliver my newspapers. I go to school. 
I wanted to go to college. I wanted to be an astronaut. I knew, because that's when they were getting ready to shoot. You know, that was 1960, would have been about 1966, right inside there, 67. So, so you know, that's what Sputnik and Russia and America. And I wanted to be an astronaut. And I knew I had to be a scientist, and I knew I had to go to college to be a scientist. The only way I could do that is to get in the ROTC. I remember driving to Miami, University of Miami, sitting there, watch the guys at ROTC. And I was only maybe like, at this point, 10th grade, thinking, I'm going to be an astronaut. I'm going to get in the ROTC. My father was in the Air Force. Not, I ever saw him. I never seen him. But he was in the Air Force. So that made me want to be Air Force ROTC. Well, I got a young girl pregnant, 17. So here I am trying to survive. And I got a baby coming. And I'm like, oh my gosh. So I got in my car, and what every guy does, a woman says, hey, you know, I'm pregnant. Like, is it my baby? You know, trying to like, you know, it, how do you know it's mine? You know, like, you know, trying to, you know, that's the way we are. I mean, that's just an automatic answer, right? So I got in my car, and I drove to leave Miami. I was going to Orlando. I just left that night, packed my car, and I was gone. I happened to have a Renault. It has aluminum blockhead and apparently didn't have enough water in it. And somewhere up in West Palm Beach, north of, north of Fort Lauderdale, it just died. That's when the turnpike had just opened. And I'm like, wow. Now, you have to understand something. See, I worked when I was 12 years old, and I worked all summer long, and I saved every penny. And before I started school, I went to Burdines which is a very, very high-end store. I bought Gantt shirts, Weijin shoes. I got a belt. And when you saw me in school, you thought I was one of the rich kids. And one of my customers in my route was a dry cleaner. And I always had my clothes dry cleaned as a kid, starting at the age of 12. I would deliver the newspaper to them. And of course, I'm sure he didn't charge me what he should have charged me, you know, I'm sure. But I came in and brought my clothes, had my dry cleaning. Well, when I was leaving Miami to go to Orlando, and it died, there was a billion mosquitoes killing me. So I wrapped myself up with the dry cleaning plastic, which doesn't work very well, right? And the car is smoking, steaming, and I'm sweating. And eventually, I got it started when it cooled down, put water in it every you know, three or four miles. And I got to Fort Lauderdale Beach, and I spent the night in Fort Lauderdale Beach. Knock on the door by a cop. What are you doing here? And I worked my way back home to Miami. <clears throat> but you have to understand something. I always wanted a family. I didn't have a family. I always wanted to be married and want to have the baby. No kids. So when Belinda was born, it was never a burden for me. But now I'm a 17, well now I'm 18 years old. I don't have a high school degree. And I have to somehow figure out how to take care of a baby and how to take care of a wife. Because she's taking care of the baby. I mean, she can only work so much, you know, you, you don't have, there's no support, I have no money and no family, I can't live with any, I can't do anything. <laughs> got my GED. Went to in Miami, got my GED, and then I started working. And I got, got into computers, because that, I, I, I uh, and I got a loan. And then ultimately, I wasn't good at computers and I got fired. And I lied to somebody. I talked to my neighbor, he was an electrician. I said, I want to be an electrician. I always wanted to be an electrician for some crazy reason. I used to put my fingers in light sockets and get nailed all the time, more than once. I mean, <laughs> seriously, more than once. And you would think I would learn that, but it was like, wow. And I was in high school. I was in electrical class. But then something happened. And they had to get rid of one person, and I was in band. So they, they put me in the band. I got out of high school. And eventually, I became an electrician. And then I found out I was a helper. And then I became a journeyman electrician. I found I was a journeyman electrician. I wanted to take the test. They say, you can't take the test. Why not? Well, you'll never pass it. Why not? It's fixed. So I studied. But there was nothing to study. There were no books. And if there were any books, there were no books for electrical, and they had no graphics, no illustrations. There was just nothing at all. So I had to just try to find stuff that was called a mimeograph paper, which is something that was mimeographed at that time. And then, of course, then it was all these things. It was all it's hard to read. And I studied and studied and studied and studied on my own. I got a 96. 
and I passed it. Everybody told me it was fixed. You could not pass it. You had to know somebody. I realized it's not true. And my wife at the time was teaching in an adult education class. And Belinda was probably about three or four years old. And they said, why don't you, uh... and I told her. Now, and I was studying with somebody while I was studying my test. I was, I was mentoring basically somebody. And that person passed a test. I passed a test. And she said, why don't you teach a class? So I said, where? She goes, adult education. My very first adult education class I had, 80 people. And there were 12 electrical inspectors. And last month, just a few days, a few weeks ago, I had six of the people, 41 years later from that class at my seminar. Six of them. They're still coming to my class. So now I'm teaching in an adult education and I get an offer by somebody to go teach for them in another location. And my class said, no, Mike, don't go teach for anybody. Go into your own business. I'm an electrician, guys. I'm an electrician. I don't know anything about running a business. No, Mike, go in your own business. And so I thought about it. And then what I did was that class, I sat down on a chair on the, on the desk, these oak, old oak chairs, tables rather, I sat up there, of course, I had cut off shorts and sneakers and came off for work. That's how I was teaching my class. And I pulled my legs on the top of the chair and I was sitting there and I said, hey guys, listen. And the inspectors all got with me at break time. Mike, because I had 12 inspectors in my class. I mean, I wasn't even a German electrician, but they had to get licensed. It was a new rule requiring them. They said, Mike, you have a gift. Go work, don't work for anybody else. Go into your own business. So I got to the class, I sat down, like a class like this here, and I said, hey. I said I was going to work for these other people, teaching a class, making more money than I am in the adult education class. You guys are saying, some of you guys are saying I should go in my own business. <coughs> if I was going to charge you, and I think the number was $125, <clears throat> for a 16-week course, how many of you, if you don't pass it this time, would pay $125 to come to my class? <coughs> don't raise your hand if it's not true. And out of the 80 people in that class, 50 people raised their hand that they would come to my class. And I'm like, because oh. it'd be easier for me, right, just to go work with these people in Miami. You know, if I would have had six people raise their hand that they're willing to, to make that payment, you know, it'd be easy for me just to go work for them. Now it's like, how do I run a class? Okay. So I'm thinking to myself, what am I going to do? Oh, 50 people at $125. Son, right here. Go ahead, sit right here, son. 50 people at $125. What does that come out to be? 50 people, 125. Was it like $6,500? I'm thinking. Now, you've got to realize something. I wasn't making anywhere close to that. I mean, I wasn't making much more than probably 10000 or 12000 a year. And now at 6000 I'm thinking, wait a minute now, you know? <laughs> Maybe this is not a bad idea. So I write my first book, and we have our, my original first book that my wife, Connie, typed, and we drew the graphics, and we put it together, and we have it in a folder at my office right now, the original book, and we printed that first book. I get to my first class. I killed myself for three months getting that book written up. I printed 50 copies. I did not know who was coming to the class because there was no registration. I just said, come to the first class free. And if you like the class, the second day, the second class, you come and you pay. So they all came to the class. I had 50 people show up that night. So I had to take my copy of the book, because I was 51, and give it to the person in front of me for that very first night. The second week, I don't know what percentage, probably, if not everybody, almost everybody came. And at that time, in 1975, people did not use credit cards, didn't have credit cards. Checks, not so much. It was cash. 100% cash. And I go to my closet with $6,000 of cash <laughs> by myself, quietly sitting. And I took the money, like you see in a movie, I took the money, and I threw it up in the air. And all this cash is floating all over to me. And I'm thinking, I'm rich. I mean, I'm rich. <laughs> And then I had to pay for the printing of the books. Then I had to pay for the coffee of the seminar. Then I had to pay for the whole 
tell, then I had to pay for the marketing and, and all. But when you don't run a business, you don't know. You're just thinking that you're rich. And then, of course, after the time you get everything else done, it doesn't work out quite that way. But guess what? I did that for a few years. And then I was working for a contractor. And the contractor had 100 employees. And I was the last person still working for him. We had a recession, a great recession, 1975 and 76. And one day I came to the shop, and he was just loading up the, the pipes in the truck. And he called me Charlie. Now, you, I hated the name Charlie. My stepfather used to call me Charlie Brown in a derogatory way, so I never liked the name Charlie. My wife calls me Charlie because it's a sweet, you know, she's kind of making it up. But he would call me Charlie just because he was a good old country boy. Hey, Charlie. He goes, I don't even know how to switch for you to put in. And I'm like, wow. So I have nothing to do, no work to do. In 1975, I have to go into electrical contracting business, and I have no clue what I'm doing, none, zero at all. <laughs> Three years later, 1978, I was able to get to University of Miami, attend their master's program, executive MBA. Now remember, I didn't finish high school. But I saw a newspaper ad, it said, hey, you can attend University of Miami, executive MBA, you don't have to have a college degree. I'm like, well, that's me. Well, it didn't really mean you didn't have to have a college degree. It means that you didn't have finished all of college and they'll give you work credit. So I go in there and see Dr. Berkman. I was like, hey, you know, and they said, oh, well, <laughs> now, I think you misread the ad. And the ad wasn't for people who never went to school. The ad was people who had gone to college and maybe short a semester or, you know, a class or two, and then we can give you some credit towards that for the executive MBA. I said, oh. I want the application, I'll fill it in. So I filled it in anyhow. He said, but they're not gonna prove it. I said, I don't care. I wanna fill it in anyhow. Matter of fact, I got a, well, I'll show it to you later on. So I filled it in. Three months later, congratulations, you've been accepted, University of Miami Executive MBA. 29 years old, never finished college, and they sent me a syllabus. And I have no clue what a syllabus is. I have, I'm in the class and I'm watching all these people just like when I got into racing uh, cars and I would see the guys take off the tires and they would be doing something, you know, they would lift up the car, they'd be taking off tires, move around and then my wife, would be, my wife would sometimes be at the track and I'd jack up my car and I would turn my tires around. She goes, why are you doing that? I'm like, I have no clue, but they're doing it, so I'm doing it, okay? <laughs> So I would get to college and I had no clue how anything works, write reports before we had computers and internet, and all this other stuff. So I had to get more knowledge. So now I'm electrical contracting, 1978 contracting, and in 1980, I looked at the time, the supply and demand curves, I decided, you know what, I'm gonna go into teaching full time. So I got rid of my electrical contracting business, I went into teaching, and I now had to really figure out how to teach because I had to find a lot of people to take a class because nobody's ever done that, just teach only. So in 1980, got with ECNM Magazine, started running my own business, teaching only, nights, Saturdays, whatever it takes, traveling, whatever I had to do. 1990, somebody calls me up, hey, would you like to be an author and write a book? And they have to understand something. I don't know how to write. I don't know how to spell. I don't even know anything about education, reality, because I didn't, I went to so many schools as a kid, I didn't finish high school, and they're gonna ask me, do I wanna write a book? I'm like, yeah, I wanna write a book. And I have no clue, what book you want? They said, we don't know, what book you, what do you wanna write? I'm like, let me think about that. So I came up with a book, and I wrote books and books and books and books. And then in the year, that was in 1990, and then in the year 2000, things didn't work out for the publisher and I. And we, we, I encouraged them to come to a mutual agreement. Let's put it that way. And we came to a mutual agreement, and then I became the publisher of the books. So now we publish the books. And so now, we're, that, was 19, uh, that was in 2000, 2016, we're a publisher. We have apprenticeship training programs. We're successful. We're doing a great job. 